Warning, spoilers for season one of Loki on Disney+. Plus. When Jonathan Major's face appeared on screen in episode six of Loki, I think I literally squealed with delight. He wasn't playing Kang, of course, not technically. He was playing He Who Remains. In the MCU, this is a variant of Kang, basically an alternate timeline version, kind of like Immortus. And the episode only hinted vaguely towards Kang himself, but we know Majors is returning to play Kang himself soon enough, and that means this guest role is sort of like a sneak peek at the big bad. So come on, I'm allowed to be excited. And a pretty large factor in why I'm excited for the MCU to finally get some Kang action is because of Avengers Earth's Mightiest Heroes. Now, if you don't know what I'm talking about, click the card on screen to see the videos I've made so far on Earth's Mightiest. Or better yet, go and watch the show yourself, then come back. But if you're like me and you know the show, I'm willing to bet you're excited to see Kang in live action. Because this time-traveling warlord was absolutely my single favourite villain in Earth's Mightiest Heroes, and I'm about to tell you why. But if Feige and co managed to translate any of the magic in this show's depiction of Kang, we are in for a good few years. Now, Kang popped up a few times during EMH's run, so I'm not going to try and discuss all of it here. What I am going to talk about today is the character's introduction, what it does and how it does it so well. Then we're going to consider He Who Remains in Loki, and what we know about Kang proper in the MCU so far, and how it seems like maybe, just maybe, the films are lining up Kang in a similar way to the show. There's two main reasons I think this, so let's get into them. I suppose the first thing to mention then is our introduction to Kang in Earth's Mightiest Heroes comes well before he's introduced to the Avengers. We first see this beautiful blue face before we see the Avengers even join forces. He and his powers and backstory appear in the show's fourth micro episode, Meet Captain America. After watching Cap and Bucky's final mission in World War II, we see the story play out again in quick time, and it seems we're not the only ones watching. It soon transpires that Kang, seated in some unfathomably distant future time, is also combing through this timeline, looking for something. It turns out that Kang the Conqueror is a warlord who has united the world and possibly more at some point in Earth's future, the Alexander of tomorrow's Earth. But his realm is in danger, and it has something to do with Captain America. As Kang finds Cap's frozen body, as he realises that Rogers survives, his reality starts to fade. It's a back to the future kind of situation. In Kang's timeline, Captain America didn't survive. Or to be more specific, Kang realises that the 21st century resurrected Cap we meet in a few episodes time will at some point take an action which will destroy Kang's Earth before he's even born. And so Kang jumps back in time to take action. And then we don't see him for ages. This plotline is very much put on the back burner for over 10 episodes, but eventually Kang shows up, attacking the Avengers to try and stop Captain America from destroying his timeline, but we'll get to that. The key point here is that one of the ways the EMH separates Kang from a villain of the week is the fact that he doesn't come out of nowhere, and that we know about Kang before the Avengers do. This is a principle called dramatic irony. Dramatic irony is a term for a situation in which the audience watching a play or a show or a movie know more about what's going on than some or all of the characters on stage or on screen. And we have that in spades when the Avengers first meet Kang. We already know his strength, his origin, his power set and his motivation. That means we know from the start that the Avengers don't stand a chance against him. Not yet, at least. So in a way, it's a fitting device to use to show a time travel themed villain, perhaps the time travel themed villain. Because this dramatic irony that comes from having already met Kang gives us a sort of precognition in comparison to our heroes, a precognition not dissimilar to that of Kang himself. The other effect of this pre-introduction and this dramatic irony is maybe obvious, but it's worth stating. It makes this character so much more threatening because we've been anticipating his reappearance for so long. We've known that in the background, the whole time, there's been this looming threat getting closer and closer. This part isn't unique to Kang, of course. All through the first season, Earth's Mightiest Heroes teases Loki as the big bad, but this principle of delayed gratification needs to be considered when thinking about Kang's introduction to the MCU, because it seems like the films might be positioning Kang to be the next big bad. 
And as such, taking the same slow burn introduction to the character as seen in the EMH would doubtless work just as well in the MCU. But let's talk again about the MCU and Kang's introduction in it, because it looks like they are actually taking a similar approach. I mentioned earlier that we know Kang himself, not a variant, is coming to the MCU soon, played by Jonathan Majors, but that's not until Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania, which is currently slated for release in 2023. That's a while, nearly two years from our first glimpse of Kang, or a variant thereof I suppose, in Loki. I'm sure that with both Spider-Man No Way Home and Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness seeming to focus on the multiverse, that there will be some hints towards the future in them, but it does seem like Kang won't properly make his appearance for a while. And thanks to the information we learn from He Who Remains in Loki about how Kangs are warlike, vicious, and nigh unstoppable, we'll be in a similar situation of dramatic irony when he does, to how it plays out in Earth's Mightiest Heroes. And with that weight, that threat just keeps on building, because we already know he's coming. The second point is perhaps in contrast to this. Another reason that Kang's introduction works so well in this show is his humanity. Sure, he's a time-traveling warlord, but the real thing driving him to defeat Captain America and restore his timeline is the love of his life, Ravonna, who is fading from existence because of the destruction of their timeline. So he's not Galactus, and he's not Ultron, he's a person, just like us, and just like the Avengers. Well, except for Vision. The result is a villain with motives you can understand, even if you don't agree with them. You can maybe even sympathize with, to a point. And at the same time, since he's human, he's not infallible. A genius, sure, and a master tactician, but there's a commonality between him and his opponents that doesn't exist with a Thanos or Ultron. And what do you know? Again, the MCU makes a similar effort to stress that Kang will share this fundamental humanity. When we're first introduced to He Who Remains, he's eating an apple. Now, maybe this was a Robert Downey Jr. on the set of Avengers moment. Maybe Majors was just hungry and they kept it in the take. Tried to hide blueberry. But I think it's more likely that the show is drawing on familiar theological imagery to mark He Who Remains humanity, along, incidentally, with his impending fall. <laughs> You see, as any Christian or enjoyer of John Milton among you will know, this is a gesture heavy with symbolism. In the Christian canon, Adam and Eve eating an apple is the one act that determined the human condition ever since. This isn't a video on theology, so I'll move on now, but... If there's any college or uni students watching who are taking film studies and theology, I think there's a pretty interesting reading of the Loki finale as biblical allegory waiting to be made, so you can have that one for free. But there's more than just the apple. This character stresses his humanity, draws attention to it, and just like Kang in Earth's Mightiest Heroes, he has a motivation you can sort of understand if not agree with. That is, he who remains decision to set up the TVA and run it the way he did. It's also kind of morally grey. I don't think Sylvia's wrong to stop it, but the episode does at the very least raise the question, what if this actually is the best solution? Again, this isn't Kang, so it's hard to know how much of this will carry over to that particular variant, but in a way, this Loki episode is like the glimpse at the end of the Captain America segment on Earth's Mightiest Heroes, a preview where we get a quick introduction, and if this is the case, I think Loki tells us we're going to get a similarly human Kang. I could keep talking, move past Kang's introduction and talk more about the character himself, how he interacts with the Avengers, how EMH nails his qualities and how the MCU could too, but I think this is a good place to force myself to stop for now. Otherwise this video would be twice as long, three times even. If you want me to follow this up with a part two, I'm happy to do so, but I've got a lot of other stuff in the works right now, so if you want it to be a priority, let's say I'll get to work on it straight away if this video gets to a thousand likes. But don't worry, whatever happens, I'll be back soon with more content. Some unrelated stuff, but also more on Earth's Mightiest. It looks like the past month has seen something of a resurgence of videos about this show. I've seen a few videos from pretty big creators pop up, and other videos by smaller channels seem to be picking up views fast. Let me know if you want me to put together a playlist of this other content on this show, because there's some really great channels talking about it, and they deserve more views. But that about wraps it up, unless...
Wait! I'm from the future! I've time travel from the 31st century to tell you! If you don't subscribe to Pillar of Garbage to catch future Avengers Earth's Mighty Zero videos, the timeline is destroyed! Please, for the good of all mankind, hit that MF subscribe button or we're all doomed! I don't know what that was, but as always, thanks for watching. I really appreciate it. See you next time.